Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to the Center for Strategic International Studies. I think it's a, a wonderful sign that uh, um, defense spending is still a topic of some interest, notwithstanding all of the reports of its imminent demise. Um, you know, some of us in the think tank business have been saying for years that the, the time will come when the rise in defense spending will cease and the reductions will begin. And we all have known that at sooner or later we would be right. Uh, we, we may be on the verge of that. Um, I have a couple of administrative notes. Uh, I'd like to welcome those who have joined us on uh, the web this morning as well. Um, there should be a way for you to uh, access the charts that we're going to be showing here this morning so that you can follow along at home. And uh, uh, also, you can send us your questions when we get to the question and answer period. Uh, we'll put my uh, email up as the last chart, and that'll give you an opportunity to send us an email. Uh, and I'll have my BlackBerry out and be able to read them. Uh, that also gives me the opportunity to remind you here in the audience in the room to silence your cell phone and other devices so that uh, when somebody calls you with an important message, uh, you won't get it. Uh, so if you would please do that as well. We've been here at CSIS running the Defense Industrial Initiatives Group now for the better part of a decade. And over that period of time, we've been spending a great deal of effort trying to understand where the federal government spends its contract dollars. Many of you have tracked for years our annual reports on federal spending on services, professional services industrial base, as we call it. Um, about a year ago, we began to realize that we should go beyond the services business to look at all contract spending and also to focus on the key entities or the key de uh, components across the federal government. Obviously, the Defense Department is the biggest chunk of this. Two-thirds of defense contract spending or government contract spending is done by the Defense Department. Uh, back in January, we issued a preliminary version of this report uh, for uh, uh, defense contract spending, and that includes products and services uh, across the board. This is an update from that report. Uh, we had a number of issues that came up, uh, and we've gotten new data. So in a sense, what we're doing today is revisiting what we discussed with many of you back in January. Um, but here's what's really new. Number one is uh, we now have fiscal year 10 spending data. At that point, we only went up through FY09. And given that it was already 2011, obviously that was a bit of a lag. There's about six months between the end of the fiscal year and the time that the federal procurement data system has a pretty good set of data up. It doesn't get uploaded all at once. It gets uploaded sort of one contract at a time. And so we have to wait until we've got a cumulative uh, balance that looks good enough that we think we can draw some conclusions from it. In addition, all of the numbers in this report are in FY10 constant dollars. So every single number that you got in January is now different. So throw that chart away and, and use the report here that, uh, that we've issued today. Um, the, we do, though, also have a number of key issues that we've updated. Uh, one of the questions that we spent a lot of time looking at has to do with the expenditures in research and development and with expenditures on classified data. There were some disconnects between the overall appropriated dollars in DOD for R&D and the amount that we could track through contracts. Um, much of that discrepancy uh, is related back to the fact that the federal procurement data system basically doesn't have classified contracts in it. And so we've done a good bit of work reconciling that. You'll see that in our charts and our discussion this morning. Uh, the second issue that came up that we began to wrestle with also starting in January is that there's a disconnect sometimes in the way the government classifies uh, whether a contract is a product or a service and the way the company itself would look at those uh, data. Uh, for instance, uh, and we'll, we'll cover this when we get to some of the charts on there, but for instance, uh, the company may categorize that contract as a service contract uh, because in its mind it's logistic support and that's a service. The government may, may uh, categorize it as a product because it's tied to a particular weapon system and they put it in that weapon system category. And, and the third is that we've done a good bit of additional work in breaking down each of the DOD components in the categories of products and services and uh, R&D. So that's kind of what's changed between then and now. We're going to go through about 30 charts here this morning. We're going to go through them pretty quickly. We'll then throw the floor open for questions. And uh, if there aren't any, uh, we'll let you all go to lunch early. So, Guy? 
Yes, thanks, David. Let's go to the next slide. Um, just a few uh, quick comments in addition to what David said on the data that we use. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, all um, charts that you'll see here are primarily based on federal procurement data system uh, numbers. Um, they will all be in 2010, FY 2010 um, um, dollars, and the most recent year will be 2010. Um, the other thing to mention um, here is that supplementals are not classified separately. Um, so we have no ability to distinguish between what came out of the base budget and what was uh, a supplemental spend. Um, other than that, let's get to the actual charts. This chart really portrays two different sets of data. The bars that go start at the bottom and go up is, is total defense outlays in a given year. The source of the data is OMB. And you can see the reductions during the 90s as we start, and this is all in FY10 constant dollars, at about $450 billion in spending in 1990, dipping down to about $330 billion by the mid-90s, and then climbing back up to $664 billion last year. Inside that bar, the lower part, the dark brown, is spending on contracts. Uh, the upper part of that bar is all non-contract spending. So that would basically be pay and benefits um, and uh, in-house operations, if you will. Um, the intriguing thing is the trend over the last three or four years in terms of total DOD contract spending. And, and that is the numbers. They're kind of hard for you to see. You can see them in your, in your paper copy a little bit better. Um, from a peak of $390 billion in FY08, a drop of about $7 billion in FY09, and then a drop of almost $20 billion uh, in FY10. So you're beginning to see, in terms of total contract dollar spending by DOD, a decline that actually started two years ago. When we sat here in late January, we said we had one year of data. It was only down a few billion. We didn't know if that was an anomaly or a trend. We can now see that it's not only a trend, it's accelerating. And it's accelerating at a time that outlays were still going up. And of course, part of the reason outlays are still going up, even though the budget is rather flat, is there is a lag time for a lot of these dollars in terms of when they actually spend. Um, just now at this point, I'll give you a, a brief outline of how we'll break down the rest of the charts. Uh, the main areas will be, again, uh, as we had in January, the product services and R&D breakdown. Uh, overall for DOD, uh, for the particular uh, military departments and then other DOD, um, we'll look at contract characteristics, specifically competition, uh, levels of competition. Uh, the funding mechanisms that DOD uses for its uh, contract awards and the vehicles that it uses for those. Uh, and then the last few charts, we'll look at the industrial base. Uh, for those of you who remember the January brief, uh, we'll have the top 20 companies um, overall broken down into product services and R&D. And then we'll look at the breakdown of the DOD market into small, medium, and large companies doing sort of a, a comparison of 99 and 2009 to see what what's been going on there. So our next chart is contract spending in DOD for products. And this, uh, uh, the, the line across the top is the percentage of total contract spending. So you can see back in the early 90s, it was uh, a little bit over 55, 56% of total contract dollars were going towards products. By the mid-90s, it dipped down into the low 40s in terms of the percentage because, in fact, we were in the procurement holiday and the outsourcing and the reinventing government initiative had led to a lot more spending on services. Um, the post-9-11, there was a little bit of a bump in percentage, but interestingly enough, and you'll see this uh, later as we compare the charts of products and services, uh, the increase in services contract spending actually outpaced the increase in product spending except for a couple of years. And so products never got back up to that 56% level that they were at the end of the Cold War. You've got a little bit of a bump on the right in, in uh, 2007 and 8. That's kind of the MRAP effect, if you will, uh, in terms of overall product dollars. And you can see here is where essentially almost 100% of your dollar decline in overall DOD contract spending <coughs> comes in products as we've dropped 30 billion between FY08 and FY10. Next is uh, services, and this has been the fastest growing sector of the three um, 
in the last 24, uh, 21 years that we're looking at for, for in this report. Um, just over 6% annual growth uh, over 21 years. And um, again, R&D and products not, not in that same, uh, not with that same growth rate. But what's interesting to see is that despite being relatively flat over the last two years in terms of the overall spend, the share of services has actually gone up to a level, probably its highest level in, in this 20 year period. Um, just, just in the sort of 45%, 47% uh, of overall spend on DOD is now services despite, um, again, the, the beginnings of the downturn that we're beginning to see. Um, We've mentioned this before, but let's just mention it again here because it happens a lot in services. Uh, the issue of how FPDS classifies uh, the service versus how some companies might classify services. This, this accounts for a little bit of, uh, of uh, differences in, in absolute numbers here. Um, and it's worth, uh, I think, saying again as we, we, uh, we look more into uh, how we can improve the data and uh, how we improve policy that's based on the data. Right. And, and specifically, um, the, we believe that the services dollar value here is understated because the military departments classify as a product contract things that are, in, in effect, um, uh, logistic services. And so the products dollars are overstated, the services dollars are understated. We don't know by how much. You'd have to go through contract by contract to, uh, to figure that out. The Federal Procurement Data System, FPDS, <coughs> classifies R&D as a service. And so whenever OMB or the Office of Federal Procurement Policy issues its own summaries of, of spending uh, across the government and they show services dollars as, as high and, and uh, products as lower, um, you'll know that R&D is classified as a service. Now, a lot of those R&D dollars actually deliver a product, as you well know. There's about $3 billion in R&D uh, in the F-35 program. That's actually delivering airplanes. Uh, there's about a billion dollars of R&D in the DDG-1000. A year. Um, a year, per year. And so, you know, there, there are some numbers here. We break it out separately because actually for defense, tracking R&D separately is pretty critical because that's your investment in the future. Here, uh, you, you'll see that uh, it's been relatively flat, roughly around the $40 billion level for the last several years. But here is where I think it's important for us to emphasize to you, this does not include um, classified contracts. And using other data that is outside of the Federal Procurement Data System, and we are in part um, beholden to the uh, Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessment for its reports on this, um, that $41 billion in R&D for FY10 in the Defense Department in R&D um, should have added to it the following numbers. There's roughly $20 billion in classified R&D contracts that does not show up in here. That gets you up to about $61 billion. There's probably something on the order of 11 or 12 or $13 billion that is spent internally, that is, on government personnel and on government operations and buildings and, and, uh, and so on. And that leaves us somewhere around six or seven billion that we cannot track to one of those three categories. That's not inconsistent with the, uh, with the discrepancies that we see between appropriations data, uh, agency data, and the federal procurement data system. So by and large, this understates the total R&D spending by about 50%. It understates the R&D contract spending by about a third. This next chart is basically the three, the last three charts as trend lines thrown together just to give you the effect of how each, uh, each of these sectors' shares has changed over time. Uh, what's interesting for us here is, I think, two things. One, um, if you consider the left-hand side of the chart, the early 90s, um, as where we witnessed uh, our last um, big drawdown in defense spending, um, where, as David mentioned, products began uh, dropping um, and we started spending more on services as, uh, as uh, we cut back on, on military personnel. That gives you some indication of potentially where the next drawdown might be heading that we started in about 2008 um, with, uh, again, products dropping significantly, services going up, um, only this time the lines might meet and uh, the trends might 
uh, continue with services um, beating products out um, in the next year or two. Um, so if the, if the last drawdown on the, on the far left is anything to go by, the drawdown that we're beginning to experience in, on the far right, um, might, that might give us an indication of what this drawdown might look like. We were kind of thinking that when we got the FY10 Call of row of this that we would have some visible indication of where this was going because the FY09 data said, okay, it looks like one's going down and the other's going up in terms of products and services. Uh, the reality, though, is that they, they both veered enough that we have no clue what FY11 is going to look like. And, uh, and so, you know, we, we've got a big question mark sitting up there. I would also like to put in a plug here. All of you uh, who, are, uh, who were invited to this session today will be invited to a, an event that we're having on June the 8th. Um, it's our global security forum across uh, all of CSIS, but one of the particularly interesting panels of that will be the lessons from the last drawdown and, and how they would apply to, uh, to what we think is coming uh, down the future. It'll be a very exciting and interesting panel uh, as we go forward there. Now let's look at spending by component. So we've looked at products and services and R&D across DOD. Um, so the, the top part here, the sort of uh, yellow, orangish, khaki colored is, uh, is the other DOD. That's everything that's not Army, Navy, Air Force, Military Department. Uh, the light blue is the Air Force, the dark blue is the Navy, and the green at the bottom is the Army. Um, this is all updated from before. This is in FY10 data for, for uh, and you, you can see actually what a significant increase in the Army that really drove an awful lot of this total expenditure um, and also a very significant increase in the other DOD, which back in FY2000 was $23 billion. It tripled to $74 billion last year. Um, this, of course, is everything from DLA, Missile Defense Agency, uh, Special Operations Command, et cetera. Let's look at each one of these in turn. So for products, um, as David mentioned, the big growth really has been in the Army and in other DOD. Other DOD, again, primarily driven by DLA and MDA here, um, Defense Logistics Agency, Missile Defense Agency. Um, what's interesting, again, is we might be getting some indication in the data from the last two years that the drawdown is beginning. Um, FY10 alone, uh, compared to FY09, sees a, a drop in about $3 billion in each of the uh, services, um, except for the Air Force. So, uh, yeah, I mean, products, again, in, in the last drawdown was the area uh, hit hardest, and it might be looking like that's happening again. I should note that at the bottom of either of these charts, we give you the combined average annual growth rate for each of these. Of course, that's taken over the whole 21-year period. And, uh, and really, there's sort of two separate decades in that period. There's the 90s, where right. things were sort of going down. And then there's the aughts, where everything was sort of going up. Uh, in our report, uh, we've got more detail on each of these. Uh, and, and as we continue down this road in the future, I think we'll continue to expand that out. This is services spending uh, by components. And again, uh, over the last decade, what you see here is that the Army has basically tripled. Uh, the other DOD component has basically tripled. The Navy and the Air Force have gone up by roughly 50 percent. So the distribution of growth is dramatically different between the ground forces and the support for those ground forces that come out of other DOD accounts and the uh, sea and air forces, which have gone up by substantially smaller percentage. On R&D, and again, I would caution you to, to remember David's earlier comment about this, these numbers being quite low in terms of overall spending. We know that um, DOD spends about $80 billion a year last year um, on RDT&E, um, so the total here of 43 percent is, is about 50 percent of that. Um, what's interesting here is that of the uh, DOD components um, with spend on R&D, the one that's uh, uh, underrepresented most here as a result of classified programs not being counted in FPDS is the Air Force. About 50 percent of the Air Force's RDT&E dollars are in classified uh, programs, so that light blue uh, second bar from the top in each of these years uh, is about 50 percent higher in reality 
Um, we just can't capture that, those classified programs, those classified R&D programs. Uh, the same is true for the other DOD category, which is where you have a lot of your other classified intelligence uh, right. contracts. And so the $6 billion in R&D reflected here for other DOD, there's almost $5 billion in classified contracts in that same category. So it's understated by about 50 percent. Now let's look at the Army. Uh, this is contract spending with the Army. The bottom, the, uh, the bar graph at the bottom shows you the dollar value, and you can see there's been a bit of a decline since the peak in 08. Um, the top line shows you the percentage, and while there was a little dip between 08 and 09, that's flattened out. Essentially what's happening here, and, and we'll be very interested to watch this trend as we get the FY11 data, is that the Army's dollars are declining, but their percentage share of DOD appears to be stabilizing. And it's stabilizing, of course, at a level that's roughly double what it was in the 1990s. Um, whether this is sustainable over the long run, I kind of doubt it. But whether it is sustained up and through the time that we actually have substantial drawdown from Afghanistan, which is, you know, sometime between now and 2014, uh, that's a, a much more likely outcome. So I think the future picture of the Army here is really two different questions. One is the next year or two. The other is the longer term, 2014 and beyond. Let's look now at the other services. Looking at the Navy, uh, probably a, uh, an unnecessary comment for, for our audience here today, but I'll make it anyway, that Navy's budget includes the United States Marine Corps' budget. Uh, so that's factored in here. We, again, have no ability to break that out because FPDS doesn't, uh, doesn't categorize the, the Marine Corps differently. Um, and so despite, despite the Navy's budget, including the Marine Corps' budget, and we know the Marine Corps have had an increase over the last 10 years at least, uh, uh, given the operational tempo that they found themselves in, the Navy's share of overall DOD contract spending has dropped from about 37% in 1990 to about 24% in 2010. Um, well, we'll be interested to see how that that trend continues, especially given that in the next few years we've got LCS coming up, we've got uh, the second Virginia class submarine coming up. Uh, we'll probably drive uh, drive this trend a little uh, in a little different direction than it's been going the last few years. And with Air Force, you see the similar decline in terms of percentage uh, from its historical average in, in the 30s down to uh, actually below 20%. Uh, it would be above 20 percent if you had classified contracts in here. That would add another $12 billion basically to the Air Force's total. Uh, but what's intriguing to us is that that decline, and that decline has been pretty steady now for about 15 years, seems to have leveled off in terms of percentage over the last couple of years. And as far as other DOD components go, again, we've, we've mentioned this already, but um, the, the share in terms of uh, their overall DOD spending um, has almost tripled. Uh, well, sorry, the value has actually tripled in the last 10 years, uh, which is what has been driving up the, the trend line on the top of this chart. Um, again, driven primarily by DLA and MDA in the last 10 years. This is a chart that combines Army, Navy, Air Force, and other DOD together. At the time we briefed this back in January, I noted that there was a signature event here that occurred when the Air Force dropped below other DOD uh, back in 2008, an event worthy of a press release, except we actually couldn't notice it until two years later when the data become available. Um, now, if you actually adjusted this to add back in the, the uh, classified contracts, the effect would still be the same, but the difference between the other DOD line and the Air Force line would be so small that on this chart with the scale that's here, they would actually look pretty much like the same line. Nonetheless, it's a dramatic redistribution of the way the DOD spends its money. Uh, the fact that, in fact, the military departments are, are that no military department dominates to the extent it did in the past and the other. Now, once we actually reduce our fuel consumption, and you tell me when that'll be, uh, uh, you know, it'll show up in one of these years out here. Others going to drop back down because roughly 12 to $15 billion a year of those contracts is for, uh, for fuel. And at some point, uh, that goes down. We'll look now at the breakdown of product services and R&D for each of the uh, departments or each of the DOD components, starting with the Army. Um, overall, services has been the largest, uh, the lar has seen the largest growth. Uh, in the Army um, over the 21-year period. Uh, of course, if you just look at the last 10 years, 
it's been about even between products and services um, given operations in Iraq, Afghanistan, other. Um, one other thing to note about the Army's uh, R&D spending is that there's actually very little classified information or classified programs there. So this number is actually fairly, uh, fairly uh, real in terms of actual spending overall. Navy spending uh, by category, uh, R&D has been relatively flat over the last six or eight years. Um, procurement dollars or products are up considerably uh, because of uh, growth in, in ship deliveries in the, in the aughts. Um, services dollars relatively constant. And for the Air Force, um, the service category has actually, again, been the, the one with uh, um, high growth here. Um, almost doubled from uh, uh, 1990 to 2010. Um, one other uh, thing to note is that uh, though products have been relatively flat and seen very little growth in this 20-year time frame, we've got some big ones coming up in the next few years, tanker, joint strike fighter, um, next generation bomber maybe. So that lower bar, the dark blue bar, uh, might be the one, the next one to right. see significant growth in the coming years. And here we have the spending product services R&D for the other DOD category. Uh, keep in mind, of course, there's about five billion in classified R&D that doesn't show up in this chart. Now we're going to look a bit at uh, um, a different way of slicing it. We're going to step aside from the DOD components, Army, Navy, Air Force, other DOD, and take a look at the different types of contracts themselves. And the first contract characteristic we'll look at is competition. Um, interestingly, almost consistently over, and by the way, we, for these categories, uh, we're looking at uh, the last 10 years or 11 years as opposed to 20, 21 years, uh, just because that's the period for which we have what we feel is uh, data that we, we can be confident in. Um, earlier years just don't have the level of granularity and, and uh, uh, um, in the, of the data that we, right. we'd like to see in order to be confident. Um, so over this last 10, 11 year period, what's been interesting is uh, that the split between competed and uncompeted contracts has been about 50-50. And I say this because for, for us, um, even though uh, the middle bar here of uh, competition with single offer is technically a competed contract, the fact that there's only, there was only one offer for us uh, uh, makes it a, a, a no competition type of contract. And so if you add the uh, sort of the pinkish red bar at the top to the, the middle bar, the purple bar in the middle, um, that for us really is the no competition category, uh, where either there really was no competition, the contract wasn't competed, or it was, and the government thought it was going to uh, receive multiple offers. It actually only received one. Um, sadly for us, this was the category, the competition with single offer, this was the category which saw the highest uh, level of growth in these last 10, 11 years. Um, here, probably, we, yeah, here on, the, on this chart, and, and for those of you following at home, this is pay, chart 22 on your, uh, on your website. Um, you've got basically 20% per year increase in competition with a single offer. One of the things that we have to do that we have not done yet is break this data down by products, services, and R&D as well. Um, because w one of the most important factors uh, in, in our minds is, is that growth in competition with a single offer in the category of products, where it would make sense in many cases that you would like to have competition and you want to have competitive categories, but there's just not a lot of bidders out there? Or is it in the services arena, where at least in theory, uh, there should be multiple uh, offers for almost every service that's put out there? We're going to have to look at the data and break that down. Um, we also looked by what we call funding mechanism, that is the type of fund uh, structure of the contract. 
Uh, this is chart 23. The bottom, uh, about $240 billion in, in DOD contract spending in FY10 uh, is fixed price contracts, and that has had about a 10 percent per year growth rate. Um, the, the next part of each bar graph, uh, the cost reimbursable, $104 billion in FY10, has grown at an average rate of about 7 percent. That means that we've had a higher emphasis on fixed price contracting and that that emphasis has, in fact, yielded results. Um, the next category up, the kind of orangish category there, is time and materials. It's had a pretty good growth rate, about 9 percent per year, but there's only about $15 billion. But the biggest factor that's a change from when we were looking at this before in, with FY09 data is our concern over the category called combination, which was basically in, in, uh, in the FPDS guidance uh, was where you had a mix of fixed price uh, contract line item uh, numbers and deliverables and cost-based uh, or time and materials-based. And we couldn't therefore distinguish what type of contract funding mechanism you had in place. Our concern was that it had such an enormous growth rate going from about $4 billion in FY06 to $45 billion in FY09. Somebody woke up because it's down to only $6 billion in FY10. Now, we have no proof that this is a direct result of CSIS's analysis, but we would love to take credit for this result. So we're going to go out and, and we eagerly await to see what happens uh, in FY11 and whether or not uh, this continues. But obviously, from the point of view of, of if, if OMB and the Office of Federal Procurement Policy is attempting to track compliance with the guidance that says increase the use of fixed price contracts, increase the use of competition, and they are using, as their guidance memorandum state, the federal procurement data system as their way of measuring. This is major progress because actually now you've got some correlation between the data that you're trying to judge and the data you're managing by. Yeah. Yeah. Let me. Uh, we're now going to turn to the. Uh, you skipped one? Oh, I skipped a chart. Let's see. That's because oh, yeah. this isn't. I didn't turn over my page. Um, spending by contract vehicle. One of the things that we started tracking in, with vigor in our services contracts data is the use of definitive contracts, indefinite delivery vehicles, purchase orders, single award indefinite, and multiple award indefinite. And we've broken down the DOD contract spending for the last 12 years by that category here. What this chart shows you is, in fact, a pretty remarkable stability by type of vehicle, notwithstanding the fact that uh, um, there's been a, a much more of an emphasis on indefinite delivery vehicles over that time. Um, again, what we need to do is to break this down by products, services, and R&D because we think there's some substantial differences across those categories here. And in the next update of this report, when we roll in the FY11 data uh, next year, we'll certainly have that in play. Now let's turn to the industry rankings. This chart shows you the top 20, and rather than track year by year, um, as all the other charts do, we just use 99, the start point, and 2009. We haven't updated for 2010 yet um, because the granularity of the data available from the federal procurement data system didn't arrive in time for us to be able to break it down. We'll probably issue an FY10 update of this in advance of next year's report. It'll be available on our website. I think um, it's, it's important that we point out that these numbers are not necessarily equal to what the firms themselves show in their data. This is what we can track against the federal procurement data system for DOD. There's roughly, for instance, $5 billion of DOD contract spending that goes through a GSA contract. Many of the firms who know that it's DOD money coming to them would show this as defense revenue. We don't capture it that way because the way we rate the federal procurement data system number, those show as GSA dollars. So there's going to be disconnects uh, between here. In addition, of course, uh, agents, uh, entities, firms often capture subcontract dollars as show that as defense revenue as well. And here, all we have is prime dollars. And so we're allocating 100 percent of a prime contract to the, whoever is the prime contract awardee, even though they may actually recognize from a revenue point of view 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 percent of those dollars. There are no good data yet available for breaking this down by subcontractor. Companies know that. The government does not. And so there's, there's potentially some substantial disconnects here. Nonetheless, 
you won't actually be surprised by the names up here. All right. Uh, the top five, Lockheed, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, General Dynamics, and Raytheon, are essentially the same top five as in 1999. There's substantial change in the next 15, if you will. Um, I, it's also worth noting that this, these numbers in this ranking does not reflect the uh, separation of Huntington Ingalls Industries Incorporated from Northrop Grumman. Uh, that'll be a pretty dramatic change uh, when we get to FY11 and 12 uh, data in terms of the rankings here. Uh, HII essentially will show up as uh, somewhere in that uh, uh, five to t 6 to 10 category there, and Northrop will probably uh, drop down to number five, uh, al although there's obviously a lot of other things that can happen between now and the time that that comes up. Is there. So we're just showing the government data here. This is what the rankings are. There's a few interesting things that we'll point out. Let's look at them now by products, services, and R&D. So for products, the, looking at these two years, 1999, 2009, you really see the effects of operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, the, the new companies in the top 20 list in uh, 2009 are really the companies um, that are either, A, in the business of selling fuel to the uh, Department of Defense, Shell Oil, BP, Bahrain Petroleum sort of on the lower end of those top 20, but newcomers since 1999. Or B, it's the companies that um, specialize in ground systems. That's your BAE systems, that's your McAndrews and Forbes Holdings who own AM General, it's Oshkosh, and uh, all these companies um, just didn't exist uh, or weren't on the, sorry, not didn't exist, they weren't on the 1999 list uh, um, at all. Of course, some of that uh, for, the, for the land systems companies, uh, some of that growth um, was achieved via mergers and acquisitions. And in fact, um, that's true for the other companies as well. Northrop Grumman uh, bought Lytton, bought Avondale, and bought Newport News in the 1999-2001 timeframe, um, doing uh, wonders for its uh, placing, taking it from six to five. But um, if you look at the, the overall contract value, that's, that's a significant growth. Um, same for BAE Systems. Uh, United Defense and Stuart Stevenson were bought, um, and those helped propel it to the position that it was in in 2009. Looking at services, and, and particularly focusing on the 2009 category, the single most dramatic thing that leaps out at you is that uh, when the Defense Department says the fastest growing part of the budget is health care, it's clearly reflected in these numbers. You have uh, HealthNet, you have TriWest Healthcare. If you actually added up the services dollars in DOD health care and combined them into a single category, they'd be either number one or number two on this chart. That's where the growth has occurred immensely um, over, over time. The other thing that you see, of course, is there is a substantial in addition to healthcare, substantial changes in the elements of the companies that make up this category. We think this will probably be the most volatile area going forward out of these three. And by comparison, in R&D, very, very little change, um, especially if you consider the, the share of the top five and the top 20 of the overall uh, DOD, RDT, and E spending. Again, again, this is just the unclassified spending, bear in mind. But the top five account for about 50% of that, and the top 20 account for about 75% of that. So you really have a, a relatively small number of players uh, taking the uh, sizable chunk of the DOD, RDT, and E budget. Another interesting thing to, to note on this list uh, is the uh, primacy of, of non-private sector elements. Uh, in 1999, there were four entities um, that are either FFRDCs or UARCs, University Affiliated Research Centers, um, or nonprofit research uh, organizations. And in 2009, there were five, MIT, Aerospace Corp, uh, APL, MITRE, and Battelle. Um, and all of these have significant chunks of uh, R&D uh, contracts and, uh, and are not part of really the sort of what we would consider the traditional or the, the, the classic defense industrial base. The final set of charts that we'll look at 
uh, breaks our industry down into three categories. We call them large, medium, and small. Um, this is not actually by size of company. It's by the total amount of dollars, contract dollars, that they get from uh, DOD annually, if you will. So large contractors are those that receive three billion or more in FY10 dollars or uh, and, and no, in, it's annual, it's uh, annual uh, revenue. Annual revenue, all right. And medium or bet uh, between above the small business set aside threshold and below three billion dollars. And small, of course, is those that meet the government's test of, of small business. What the chart shows you is the difference in terms of the percentage and in terms of the dollars between 1999 and 2009. Uh, the top bar, obviously, the shorter bar is 1999, fewer dollars being spent. The larger bar is the, or uh, the bottom bar is, and the larger bar is FY09. Um, and then you also have essentially uh, an ability to compare the percentages. What you see is that overall in DOD contract spending, large contractors have grown at an annual rate in terms of their revenue of 10.8%, medium at 7%, and small contractors at 9.6%. Those who are in this medium category think of this as being squeezed. Now, obviously, growing at a rate of 7% per year is not exactly squeezed. If you were on Jenny Craig, that would not be called a success. Um, but uh, uh, nonetheless, they're not keeping up with the same growth rate. Let's look then at each of these, ca at this uh, by category, products and services, et cetera. So for products, really, the, the, the trend that we, we saw in the previous chart um, is really highlighted the most. Um, the, the share of the overall market for large companies uh, between 1999 and 2009 grew from 57% to 62% um, at an annual rate of 11.4%. Um, and that's really been a sort of the, the, the driver of the, the mid-tier squeeze, so to speak. Um, and it's been, an, it's been a squeeze from the top uh, and not from the bottom. The small companies, um, and here the good news is that the small business set aside seem to be working. Um, in almost all the, the areas, the small businesses have maintained their market share over that 10-year period. And so the, the growth of the large companies has really come at the expense of the market share of the medium-sized company. In the services arena, this effect is less so. Um, where you, you have uh, medium contractors have uh, probably been the least squeezing here. Nonetheless, um, medium-sized contractors in 1999 had roughly 30 percent more dollar value business and services contracts from DOD uh, than large contractors did. By FY09, large contractors were up about 8 percent over medium-sized contractors. Small businesses increased at a 9.3 percent per year rate in that same time period in services. It's actually interesting, I'm going to go back one. Small businesses' annual growth rate in products is actually higher, 11.6 percent per year growth rate, than it is in services, 9.3 percent. We didn't expect that. We actually expected that small business would have a higher growth rate over that period of time in the services business than in the products business. And this is one where we not well, we don't believe this is because of DOD categorizing services as a product because a lot of small businesses are not in the, the pure weapon system service arena. Um, sorry, just another quick comment on the, on the services right. uh, slide. The, the share of the overall market going to small companies is actually largest in services, uh, where small companies account for about 23 percent of the, the market in products and R&D. They're at about 13 percent. Right. So really a significant, uh, a significant difference is in the service sector. Um, R&D, again, the story is sort of the, 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 the lion's share of the market being held by the large companies. Um, that share has grown from 65 percent in, in 1999 to 76 percent in 2009. Um, again, those top five, top 20 companies that we saw in the previous chart dominating this market. Um, and again, the squeeze uh, from the top uh, affecting the medium-sized companies um, that fell from 22 percent of the market share in R&D to about 14 percent, with the small companies being relatively protected and remaining relatively stable at 12, 13 percent over this 10-year period. And keep in mind, this is where 50 percent of your contract right. dollars aren't reflected because they're classified programs. 
Um, you know, anecdotal history says a lot of those classified uh, contracts are going to uh, medium-sized companies, uh, but it doesn't take a very many big satellites to sort of uh, offset that in terms of the distribution of dollars. So, uh, from that, uh, that essentially ends our briefing. You got a copy of this book. There's accompanying text on each of the charts in the book. Um, there may be places where our words here this morning are different than the words in the text. In every one of those cases, the text is right and we're not. Um, uh, and, and where the text is wrong, it will later be updated so that it will be right. Uh, this is kind of a, a living process for us. We, we do maintain these uh, uh, documents on our website. Uh, as time goes by, we get better data, we update them, and so the, the, the hard copy that you have will have a half-life. The uh, document on the website will have a much, uh, a much more robust uh, uh, constancy to it. Uh, and the beauty of the federal procurement data system is uh, not only does it update to add next year when it gets here, it's constantly going back and updating the past as well. Uh, so that there's a continual change in the reality which it reflects. Um, we often don't understand what those changes mean. Uh, but we track them diligently nonetheless because um, we have to live on the assumption that the government's entering its data accurately, even though we know that's not true. Um, but where we find discrepancies and, and uh, disconnects, obviously, uh, we, take, we take some uh, uh, precision in pointing that out and make, making sure that the FPDS custodians are aware of that. And so over time, it, it constantly continues to improve. But the highest, the highest uh, uh, amount of chain, change year over year that we've seen in terms of uh, correcting the data back in FPDS has been about $10 billion, which depending on where you're... And that's in the aggregate, not right. individual $10 billion entries, if right. you will. Right, right. So depending on where you stand, that's either a lot of money or not a lot. Right. Well, out of $400 billion, uh, right. um, uh, that's probably our, and government wide, out of almost $600 billion in contract spending, um, that's not, uh, doesn't probably affect the quality of the analysis. Um, I'm going to open up the floor now for questions and comments. Those who are uh, on the web uh, should have access to, uh, to this by email. If you have a question, you can send it by email and I'll pick it up. Uh, let, uh, we've got microphones in the audience, so I'll recognize you. Um, and then uh, you wait for the mic. If you would identify yourself and your affiliation and then ask your question or make your comment. We'll start up here and then we'll go to the Howie Lynn with Floor Corporation. Uh, could you go to the Army contract spending by category slide? It's, it, it, in the book, it's page 20, but I think it was different numbering in the, on the slides. Yeah, OK. Uh, so you, you made a comment earlier about the uh, differentiation between services and products. Does log cap fit under the services? I assume so, but that's the question. I, I think all of the log co cap contract dollars that we found here are in the services category. Okay. So then uh, looking at the far right uh, column there for t uh, fiscal year 10, is there, do you have any idea of the $11 so far that are being spent? No. Uh, uh, that, that, I'm afraid, there's been almost no data entered yet for, uh, for 11 on the federal procurement data system. Uh, typically, there our data is starting to come in by now. Our, ex our, our assumption is that the impact of seven continuing resolutions has, has decreased the enthusiasm of the government to put that data in until they actually knew what their total dollars were and where they were going to go. Yeah. Okay. So, right, yeah. uh, let me go to the back and then come up to the front here. Uh, Bob Vilhauer with Boeing. Uh, David, in your uh, last chart you have here where you have products by contractor size, uh, and it's this is prime contracts only, so the amount of subcontracting that the primes do to yep. the mid-tiers or the mid-tiers to the small companies is not reflected, right? That's right. correct. Yeah, I think the, uh, have you tried to correlate like the size of the firm I mean, in terms of employees as, a, as another way of kind of getting at how much work, I, I realize getting supplier dollars to make an adjustment there on how much money is flowing to mid and small tier from the larger companies is, is hard to do, but, but certainly the size of the firm itself in terms of the number of employees would give you a feel for how much of the money uh, would, would flow. Has, has any kind of correlation been done on that, on the size of the, the firm versus the amount of money that 
that couldn't be done by their own employees? We, we haven't looked at that correlation, Bob, and I think there's a parallel correlation that, or, or a parallel data element that comes into play there that we'd have to accommodate as well. Uh, and that is that, you know, we define size of firm by total revenue, not by government contracts revenue. So those firms that are purely, totally dependent on the federal government for revenue uh, uh, would, would have a different distribution, obviously, than those firms that have outside commercial or, or non-government business. Um, I think the other element of that is that clearly from the point of view of small business dollars, um, we're only capturing here small business prime dollars. Um, and as we know from being in that business, a lot of those small business prime dollars flow to a large company as a subcontractor. Similarly, and in reverse, a lot of large business prime contract dollars end up flowing to small businesses because every DOD prime contractor and every government prime contractor has a small business set aside uh, threshold that they're trying to achieve. So being able to sort this out and, and what the net effect of those kinds of changes are has, has proved to be too daunting a task analytically for us to do. There is indication that the federal government is beginning to collect subcontractor data and array subcontractor data. It has not yet been made publicly available to us. We have no idea what the fidelity of those data will be when they come, but we intend to fully exploit them as soon as they, as they become available, because I think those are, those are both critical contracting questions, they're critical questions in terms of execution, and they're critical questions in terms of policy, uh, because ultimately we've got a whole set of policies out there that, that believe they're driving us towards a set of objectives, and we have no idea really whether they're achieving them or not. Um, I think there's uh, some questions down in, in front here. Let's do the right-hand side first, and, or my right, and then my left, yours. Hi, Michelle Jamrisco from Bloomberg. I wanted to ask about the uh, funding mechanism category chart. Right. Um, specifically the combination and other category. It's my understanding that OMB and DOD agreed to eliminate that category for 2010 and years following, um, and, and that's why you see that residual. Is that part of your analysis? We're talking about... I'm trying to look at my chart number here. I'm calling it chart 23, although I don't actually see a chart up there. And your question, Michelle, is in the category uh, which, which we call unlabeled? No, the combination. Combination category, it's right. sometimes called right. combination and other combined, but, right. but you have combination. And I understand the residual for 2010 is, is Six reason, billion. Right, for, for reasons of uh, OMB and DOD deciding to eliminate that category right. for future contracts, is that your analysis? That, that's our assumption, okay. and, and uh, we're looking forward to see whether FY11 actually reflects that or not. Right. Okay. Um, and of course, we applaud that because actually we think that the use of that category is both misleading and, and el eliminates the ability to do analysis. Okay. You just had no transparency into how much of the contract was right. fixed price versus cost plus. Or now, anything. having said that, let's look at what the reality of the result is. You do have complex contracts which have fixed price CLINs and, and cost reimbursable CLINs, all right? And typically the rule is go with the one that has the majority, and that's the category you put it in. That doesn't eliminate the fact that you could have a $2 billion contract, 55% of which is fixed price and 45% of which is cost reimbursable. It will now show up as fixed price since there's no longer a category called combination. Um, or it may now show up as fixed price depending on the judgment exercised by the person entering the data. Um, so there's still some analytical challenges underlying that and one needs to be careful about drawing conclusions of trends Especially, you look at the difference year to year here, it's not that dramatic. It's really hard to look at these data and say, clearly the drive to increase the use of fixed price contracts is a successful policy effort. You really can't be sure based on the data here because the trends are not dramatic enough. Our conclusion in many ways is that um, there's a level of stability here that's probably driven by something other than policy guidance. Ultimately, what do we use fixed price contracts for? When the requirements are stable enough, and the dimensions of what it is you need to bid against are well known enough, it makes sense to use a fixed price contract. The government knows what it's trying to buy. The vendors know what it is they're trying to sell and how they line up. Nobody benefits from forcing use of a fixed price contract where either the requirements are too ambiguous or the performance is too hard to measure and you're much better off in a cost reimbursable basis. So ultimately the relationship between the data and the policy isn't just one way. It's a two-way feedback and it's going to be very hard to tell how that's going. That's a longer answer than you wanted, I know. Um, but uh, but I, I think we, we would love to have more precision than we've got and it's not, it's not coming yet. Uh, next question here. Dave Eisenberg, PMSC Observer. Uh, with regard uh, to the top 
20 contractors for services, which is page 29 of your report. Uh, you raise an interesting question or caveat regarding the way policy makers categorize the data, uh, which is, are they throwing in O&M as, as service contracts? Not, uh, you raise that question, I was wondering, uh, I understand you can't speak definitively, but as of right now, I mean, what is your view or answer as to what policy makers are doing? Because if what you write is correct, it would seem that they are uh, undervaluing uh, or minimizing uh, particularly things like log cap within services. I think we're, we're approaching a circumstance where within DOD and across the federal government, there's an increasing awareness that entering data correctly into the federal procurement data system is actually important um, and, and needs to be paid attention to. We have been there before. There was a time in the mid to late 90s where there was a very serious attempt inside DOD to actually match the, the military department's own contract data with what was in the federal procurement data system. Um, my memory of watching that exercise is it took a huge amount of time and it produced a result that was barely discernible uh, in terms of improved uh, data results. Um, but that was then and this is now. And I, I think there is a, a greater emphasis. Nonetheless, I will tell you that in almost every entry, we find visible inconsistencies, fields left blank that should be entered, fields where the category that's entered is not one of the categories available based on the guidance of what you can put in that field. Um, you know, the, the amount of, of confusion. Um, I don't know if you have an estimate of percentage of, of percentage of accuracy of data entry, um, but let's say that I'm a college professor and I'm grading on the scale of 90 to 100 is an A, 80 to 90 is a B. At the overall contract level, we're probably at a B. At the total number of data entries, we're probably at a C. Um, and, but I think we're getting better, and I think that the impact of the discrepancies is diminishing, and I think that over time, uh, we all benefit from that. Now, ultimately, what you'd like is single entry data. We're, uh, I won't live long enough for us to get to that point. Um, but boy, what a great uh, result that would be, both for management and obviously for analysis. You have anything to add to that, Guy? Um, I think I think part of it is just that the deeper into the the data you go, the more you find, both in terms of how you can use it and how it's being misused or, or misentered. Yeah. And a lot of that is just really it's just human error. You're entering into this database, you know, millions of of rows a year, and so you know there's there's got to be some accounting for for just human error. But I think. The, the real test is that when, when we do find these, these issues where, where there are um, data entry issues that impact policy, right. that really impact policy substantially, that impact trends in, in, in the database as a whole, and can raise them, I think that's, that's us doing our job, and hopefully there's somebody at the other end listening and, and doing something about it. And on, on major disconnects, we'll actually go to the government right. forms, the DD350 contract forms, and do a comparison. Now, here we make a heroic assumption. We assume that the DD350 is correct and FPDS is wrong. Um, that's probably not 100% of the case, but I think that's more likely the, the, the reality because uh, that, that's somebody who's actually putting their signature on the line for, uh, for, for contract purposes. So that's, that's kind of our assumption. I think we have a question over here, one in the front here, and then we'll, we'll call, uh, see if we've got any from coming on the web. Cameron Luthi, Booz Allen Hamilton. If we could go back to the defense contract spending by funding mechanism. Mm -hmm. My question is um, more, what, yeah. it's, it's only, um, you know, broken out between combination, time and materials, cost reimbursement, fixed price. A couple more back, I think. Uh, it looks like our back button uh, um, has been defunded. It's, it's all right. Um, the question is about what's not shown. Right. 
We, we yeah. actually merge right. a number of, so, of categories together here. Um, and, and in fact, if you, if you look at our, our core analysis in the services contract, we actually have 11 different categories of, of what we call funding mechanism here, and we break them down. And in, in the services contract business, those tend to make more sense. Um, I think we merge them here by and large just for ease of, of, uh, of visualization. Um, we've got data that breaks it down by a, a much more definitive level of category. And, and uh, uh, I, I'd certainly be happy to talk with you about that at some and, other point. And to that point, broken out between services, R&D, and products. That, that part is, is research still to be done, if okay. you will. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, here in the... Uh, uh, hi, Larry Ferrero from the Defense Acquisition University. Well, the back button didn't work, but on uh, chart 4.1, 4 4-1, uh, spending by competition, can you clarify uh, the difference between the awards with the single offer and that which, it, which was labeled no competition? Right. That's the first question. There is a, a, cat a field in the federal procurement data system of was this contract competed or not. And it's, a, it's pretty much a, a binary entry. It's either yes or no. Of course, there's a third option, which is to leave it blank, which does also happen. That's our category called unlabeled. Um, that's not in the instructions, by the way, but uh, some people seem to, to come back. And uh, that part is declining. Um, there's a, another category which lists the number of offers that were received. And so um, this, is, this is ones that basically fall in the category of the, the data enterers labeled this as a competitive contract. And in, the, in, in you know, our own sampling, we've determined that they're generally, when they say yes on competition, it generally was competed. There were multiple uh, uh, offers solicited, but only one received. And that tends to fall into that category. And so. my second question is whether the data is, um, sh has enough fidelity or uh, expanse that you could determine what some of the differences in, are in the cost performance of contracts awarded where there were m multiple hmm. competitors, uh, multiple offers, single offers, right. and sole source. <laughs> Um, what a great question, Larry. We, we've actually had a research project underway for two years now attempting to tie uh, contract to performance. And uh, um, I would say that we, are, um, uh, we have made some progress in the answer to the question of how we're going to measure performance <laughs> uh, in, in terms of this, um, but we're a long ways away from being able to, uh, to achieve that. Um, I think it's a very valid question. I think it's probably a question that's different in the services business than it is in the hardware business. Uh, we've focused on the hardware side of this on the major uh, defense acquisition programs as our, as our touchstone there. And uh, um, un unless there's been a breakthrough that I'm not yet aware of, uh, we're, gonna, we're yet. a long ways away from being able to correlate uh, uh, performance in terms of results of product delivered with, uh, with the contract type and, and the funding mechanism. So. Just a very technical note on, on the competition uh, slide. The unlabeled category includes both what was or originally unlabeled in FPDS, but also where we found an error in the labeling or in the categorizing. So if, for example, if a, if a contract was defined as uh, no competition, but there were five bids, we will mark that as unlabeled because it's clearly an error somewhere. Either it was competed and there were multiple bids or it wasn't and there, were, there was just one. Um, so that, that category includes both FPDS uh, entry errors as well as just plain unlabeled originally in FPDS. So, uh, was there another question? There's one in the back and then one in the front here. Dave Drabkin, Northrop Grumman. Did I understand you to say that you agree that if a competition is labeled competition and they receive only one bid, you're not counting that as a competitive bid? We are counting as a competitive bid. We separate the category out as competitive bid with a single offer. And the reason would be? We find that it's interesting to see the difference between competitive bids with multiple offers and competitive bid with single offers. Much of the data that shows the benefit of competition, um, if you break it down by, co by uh, competition with single offer versus competition by multiple offers, the benefits from competition clearly show up better in terms of reduced price and, and uh, impact on, uh, on the dollar spent uh, where you have multiple offers. 
That's the historic analysis shows that. Um, yeah, I think that at one point we actually had a different name for this category, and uh, and we moved it to to what we call it now because we think it, it illustrates better. Um, it's clearly, though, I think an area that needs further analysis because there are multiple good reasons why you would have a competitive solicitation and a single offer. And a lot of those reasons are both consistent with uh, policy and desirable in terms of the, of the contracting entity. Um, there are other places where, in fact, people are probably caught by surprise. Um, now, we all know that the flip side of this is pretty easy because all of you who are in the contracting business know that sooner or later the contracting officer is going to say, Joe, I really need you to bid on this. And you'll say, I don't want to. And they'll say, I need you to. We have to have competition here. Um, now I'm sure that's not happened to anybody in this audience specifically, um, but, but, uh, but it, do, it does occur. And, uh, and so, you know, you, you can mask a lot of things here. And, and woe unto you if you happen to not want to win and you end up winning anyway. Uh, so then you, then you actually have to perform. That did happen to me a couple times. So um, uh, it, it's, uh, uh, I think there's still a, a fair amount of work to be done here. I think the thing, though, that, that we find as we look at this data is, is it really calls into question one of the fundamental political premises that's, uh, that's at work in the field of competition. And the political premise is that if we only worked harder at it, we could have a lot more competition than we have today. That somehow the government's falling short and not competing enough. And I think our analysis shows that, by and large, there's not a lot of additional room available for competition that isn't already occurring. Uh, and we think that's an important policy point here. You can't double the amount of dollars awarded under competitive contracts. It's just not physically possible. And there's a point at which you may have a level of diminishing returns from a policy point of view, and it would be useful for more analysis to discover where to put that emphasis and where you have the potential for the best payoff. So, uh, and I think that's a different response and what you got. But this would be one of the areas, I would say, would lend itself most visibly to that kind of effort. It would be areas where you think you're going to receive competition from the government side and there's only a single offer. Those would be the kinds of things where you'd really like to ask yourself, was this a surprise to those who put out the solicitation that they only got one offer back? And if so, why? And what can they do about it? So that's why I think more analysis is needed in that especially, area. Especially since this is the fastest growing area and it's, it's to the tune of uh, almost $55 billion a year now. Um, and so in DOD alone. Right, in DOD right. alone, exactly. Uh, now, we haven't rolled out dollars or, or similar reports yet for other agencies. Uh, we are in the final stages of, of wrapping up a report similar to this for the Department of Homeland Security. Obviously, the total dollars don't come anywhere close to the $367 billion that DOD spends under contract each year. Um, but many of the dynamics appear to be very similar. And uh, we'll be rolling that report out sometime in the next few weeks. Um, and I think uh, many of you will be interested in the results of that. We're going to plan for similar reports over the next year on the other agencies with significant contract dollar expenditures, uh, NASA, the Department of Energy, GSA. And uh, I think it will be interesting to see uh, the degree to which the kinds of dynamics that we see operating in DOD are in fact present for other agencies as well, or whether there's some unique attributes to the Defense Department that won't show up with the other agencies. We're looking forward to seeing the results of that. It's really great being in this job where you get excited about whether or not DHS has the same percentage of competition with single offers as DOD does, and then you wonder why or why not. Um, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an exciting life. If you'd have told me when I was a kid that I would grow up being excited about this, I would have, I would have shot you. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, we do find it uh, to be quite interesting. And I'm sorry we can't, we can't bring the charts back, but you've got your books, so you can go at it here. Um, another question in the front here. Nothing on the web. Nothing on the web. We may not even have anybody on the web. Paul Sullivan, USEC. Uh, just to pursue the performance question, uh, is there anything in the database that gives contract closeout prices? I mean, it's a simplistic measure of performance. Uh, granted, uh, multiple years, uh, 
growth changes, and et changes in scope, et cetera. Uh, could you, but over the law of large numbers, could you say, or comparing the, the contract award price versus contract closeout price as a measure of performance? I don't think we've looked at that, and I think that's actually a very no. interesting set of data that would be worth, uh, worth, worth looking at, Paul. No, we haven't uh, sorry for that. Uh, and, and, of course, you also have the lag time of <laughs> getting it closed out. But, uh, yeah, I, we'll have our FY09 closeouts in 2016. But, uh, uh, but it's still, that's a very worthy, uh, very worthy set of data to look at there. I, I repeat uh, a questioner here. Uh, back to the chart on page, uh, or it's 4-1, the uh, characteristics. Uh, the, the pink for no competition, maybe I missed it. Why is that so high? I mean, historically, since 99, it's been a huge part of the whole picture there. There, there are several different categories lumped together here. There's a, a whole chunk of contracts awarded by DOD that have an exception to SECA for no competition. Unique qualifications, um, you know, the, many of the contracts awarded, for example, to the federally funded R&D centers fall into that category. Uh, there's quite a few billion dollars a year that are, uh, that are under an exception to SECA or the Competition and Contracting Act, and, and there are several different exceptions that call into play there. There's another category of where it's essentially follow-on to a competed contract, but there's only one potential follow-on, and so it's awarded without competition. Uh, again, uh, back to the point you, question you asked about breaking it down into multiple categories. We've merged I think three or four different categories right. together into this area. If you break it out, none of them dominate to the $130 billion level. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll look at reflecting that data as we refine this and, and update it so you can see the, the greater revisions. It doesn't work very well in a bar graph format, but it would work fine in a, in a table form with the dollar numbers in it, and, and we'll look at putting that into here. Because I, I think it's useful to know those things that are follow-on because really, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the manufacturer of this particular helicopter is obviously the only one who's going to get the follow-on work, right? And there's no use to pretend that that's competitive. It's one of the reasons, in fact, why we think there's a limit to how far you can carry the competition. You could run a competition, but we know who's going to win it, so why bother wasting the time? There's only one viable provider. So, Was there a question, another question here in the middle, or I think we're close to being done here? Um, I want to thank you all for your attendance, your attention. Uh, I want to thank you for your support. On behalf of Guy Benari, who's my deputy here at, at CSIS, um, we welcome your reactions and feedback all the time on this. Uh, uh, virtually everything we do that's better now than it was before is as a result of something you've pointed out to us. And so, uh, you know, we kind of rely on our, on our, you guys as our customers to make sure that we continue to get better. I want to thank those who joined us on the web today. And uh, with that, we'll call the meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.